364 days, but I'm glad that you all will be able to enter into your renovated sanctuary. Uh, that is indeed a blessing. Um, if you have your Bibles, your devices, turn with me to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2, and I will read verses 6 to 10. That is Judges chapter 2, and I will read in your hearing verses 6 to 10. Judges chapter 2, and I will read in your hearing verses 6 to 10. When you have it, type in the chat, I got it. If you need some time, type in the chat, wait on me. Judges chapter 2, verses 6 to 10. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. Whatever version you have, you can read along with me. And the Bible reads, after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Herez in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Bow your heads with me as we consider for our time together the sermonic topic, this is not what I expected. This is not what I expected. Father, we're grateful for making it another day. We ask that you be with us in Jesus' name, amen. My in-laws, my wife's parents came to stay with us for Christmas for three weeks. Um, they hadn't missed a Christmas since we've been married, beginning with our wedding December 29th, um, four and a half years ago. My wife and I are expecting a baby boy in the next few weeks, so her parents came, so they didn't want to miss their chance to spoil their daughter, my wife, before the birth of their grandson. We put together the nursery, um, her father and I put together the crib, her mother um, worked her magic. I don't know how she did it, um, making the curtains and making clothes for her daughter. They decorated the walls with our starry sky and moon theme. Her sister-in-law went cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and buying stuff for her nephew. My wife's family has been very generous with their time, their energy, their love, and their resources. It is indeed true that parents will make their children walk to school, have sleep for dinner, fight their cousins and have their mouths washed out with soap. But as soon as they have grandchildren, they become different people. Money is no object. Patients are plentiful. Bedtimes are optional. High fructose corn syrup becomes essential. And the answer no becomes non-existent. I wanted to show appreciation um, to them. So I wanted to take them out to one of the best vegan restaurants in town. So I looked up the hours and we jumped into the SUV when I got home from work and we were off. And I planned my order based off of my previous experiences with the restaurant because I had been there several times over the last few years. My wife and I immediately knew what appetizers we wanted, what drinks we wanted. I knew what entree I was going to order, what I was going to order to go to have lunch the next day. I planned it out, y'all. It had been a while since we've been out to eat as a family due to COVID, and I knew that the restaurant was only operating at 50% capacity. So when we arrived, they said we were going to have a 30 to 40 minute wait for a party of four. Now that's normal for a restaurant that's popular and popping, but so we said it would be fine. But while we were waiting, my mind began wandering in thoughts about the food I was going to eat. I had skipped lunch, y'all, so I had planned to eat. 
My anticipation was rising. My expectations were increasing as at how good the food was going to be. But after waiting for about 20 minutes, I'm thinking we should just get our order to go and eat at home. I didn't want to wait 45 minutes just to be seated and then wait another 45 minutes for my food. So with great anticipation, I took my wife's order and my father and mother-in-law's order and I placed my order last. I did that so they could get what they wanted and so I could get what I wanted and I wouldn't have to share. I knew they were operating at minimal capacity, so I went over the menu and when I did that, I didn't see my desired food. And when I didn't see it, I began to get frustrated. I thought they gave me the wrong menu. I whispered to my father-in-law that this wasn't what I expected and I called one of the servers over and expressed my disappointment. And he said, I'm sorry, sir, we're dealing with a scaled down menu, and, but there are some things on the menu that have been discontinued. I'm sorry for your disappointment. So I went down the menu with decreased expectations and I ordered what I thought would be good, pasta primavera with vegetarian meat and a new barbecue veggie burger. And as soon as I placed my order, I began thinking, how can you have a scaled down menu, but offer new items? So I placed my order and I readjusted my expectations for my food, but it was still high. We took the food home and my mother-in-law was eating her vegan wrap and she had a smile on her face. My wife ate whatever burger she got and she had a smile on her face. My father-in-law was eating his veggie, whatever it was, and he had a smile on his face. And when I opened up my order, my expectations went up because everybody around me was satisfied. But as I bit into my burger with my heightened expectations, I almost gagged. As soon as the burger touched my palate, I felt a civil war inside of me and thought to myself, this is not what I expected. I put the burger down and I got upset because everybody around me is satisfied and delighted. And I sit there trying to hide my disappointment, but I took the burger and threw it in the garbage. The pasta primavera wasn't that much better. The veggie meat was bland. And I'm thinking, how can you mess pasta primavera up? I ate it because I had paid too much for the dish, but I began grinding my teeth when I swallowed the pasta primavera, saying to myself, this is not what I expected. I don't know about you, but when it is that I've looked at how much I've paid for something. And I think about how long I waited to get it, how far I had to drive for it, how cold the air was while I waited. I measured my expectations and my anticipation, thinking about the restaurant. And as I sat there at the table with discontentment, with everybody smiling around me with their bellies full, I got angry and disappointed because it was not what I expected. There was a level of excellence to the restaurant, a level of satisfaction that was testified by the reviews. I had frequented the establishment before and based upon prior experience and engagement, I went with heightened expectations. But when I got less than what I signed up for, I was disappointed. Have you ever had desires that was less than what you received? Have you ever had expectations that outweighed your reality? Do you ever have infinite aspirations that meet your human finitude? When you look at the vision for your life and what you want, and you see the difference between your vision and your reality, some of us think that this is not what I expected. I don't know about you, but that's been the commentary on my life for the last 12 months. What I desired, what I planned, and what I saw for my life did not come to pass due to an avalanche of things. And sometimes I've cried out to God that this is not 
what I expected. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of Zoom funerals and Zoom birthdays and Zoom classes. I'm tired of wearing face masks and face shields and washing my hands a hundred times a day and forgetting my mask in the car and having to turn around and get it in the process. I'm tired of still having to prove my existence to white folk who assume and stereotype me based off of the color of my skin. I'm tired of having to prove my Christianity and patriotism to my white patients. I'm tired of walking in my own neighborhood and being being worried about having the police called on me. But Bob and Jane can skedaddle around without a worry. I have three master's degrees. I pay my taxes, my tithe. I pray and read my Bible. This is not supposed to be happening to me. I don't know about you, but there are times in your life well, you will get what you don't expect. And the disappointment and hurt and anger and loss and frustration will dictate not only how you begin again, but how you receive, how you receive what God has for the next season of your life. God has plans and hopes and desires for you, but he needs your cooperation in order to begin something new in your life. And the book of Judges teaches us that it's not so much that God wants to give us something new, but he wants to fulfill what he's already pledged to do in our lives. And when we are disappointed and we see all that God desires for us and plans for us and has for us, but we don't have it now, we come to the conclusion of disappointment and say to ourselves that this is not what I expected. This is not what I signed up for. And we say to other people in bitterness and resentment, when we should be crying out to God, this is not what I expected. This is not what I planned for myself and my family. Judges 2 comes to us and says, after Joshua dis dismisses the Israelites, they go to take possession of the land each to their own inheritance. Verse seven says, they served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlive him and who had seen all of the great things that the Lord has done for Israel. But verse eight says, Joshua dies and they bury him in the land of his inheritance. At, Tim, at Timnath Heres in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. And then there comes a generation that they don't remember what God had did for them. And when they begin to experience heartache and defeat, they cry out to God that this is not what I expected. You see, you need to know something about judges. Judges is at the beginning of time when the children of Israel are without a specified leader. God began his relationship with his covenant people, with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with Moses, and with Joshua. But now that Joshua is dead, the people are leaderless. They are in the promised land, not experiencing all the promises. They are in the place of blessing but they are not receiving all of the blessings. Judges opens up where a people, the children of Israel are in the space that God ordained, that God promised, but they are neither thriving nor surviving. From Judges chapter two onwards, we see a list of judges that come along whenever the children of Israel turn away from God. They are in the promised land, but they are not receiving all of the fulfillment of God's promises. They see reminders. They see reminders of what they could have and what they should have and what they, could, what they would have if they would stop working for what God already gave them and remove obstacles that prevents them from being all that God created them to be. But in the book of Judges, we see them going through the same cycles. At the end of the book of Joshua, before Joshua dies, he reviews the history 
that the people have with God. He starts with Abraham and he recounts God's protection and provision and God's promises on behalf of and the lives of his people. And he concludes every part of the narrative when God says, I gave them into your hands. Whether it was the Moabites or the Amalekites or the Jebusites or all of the other ites, God says, I gave them into your hands. He recounts the miracle of the Red Sea. He recounts the miracle of the crossing of the Jordan. He recounts the miracle of Jericho. And he, con con he concludes in Joshua 24, verse 13, God says, I gave you land in which you did not toil. I gave you cities that you did not build and you will live in them and will eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. You see, there is a problem when the basis of your expectation is God's promise, but the fulfillment of that promise is your power. There is a problem when you expect God to do something, but the fulfillment of it is based off of your ability. God says, I will give you land you didn't work for, cities you don't build, vineyards do, you don't plant. But when you forget the one who gave it to you in the first place, you will experience disappointment. Verse 10 says that there's an entire generation that they neither know God or what he has done for Israel. You see, many people are asking God for things he has already given them. And the reason why they're asking him is because they forgot the one who gave it to them in the first place. I remember when I was in fourth grade, um, I was in fourth grade and I was bragging to my classmates. I was bragging to them um, that I had a better house than them, that I had a better car than them that I had better clothes than them because I was bullied. And when I got a little something, I began bragging. And my teacher pulled me aside and said, Joey, uh, your, your, your foster parents have that job. Um, they have the house. They have the car. They bought all of your nice clothes. Everything that you're bragging about does not belong to you. What you're bragging about belongs to your parents. You didn't do anything to get it. Everything that your parents have, they share it with you. You don't own it. You're just a recipient. And when I forgot about it, I began to look like a fool, bragging on what did not belong to me. God says, I give you lands you didn't work for, cities you haven't built, vineyards you haven't planted. And when you forget and get amnesia, you will experience disappointment. You will experience disappointment. You will have spiritual amnesia until you realize that you cannot do it without me. The Bible says the Lord delivers them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Some places in the Bible, 40 years is a generation. 40 years, you're in a place that God ordained. 40 years, you're still in the promised land. 40 years, you look around and you see the mountains and you see the trees and you see the area that God has given you, but you're in a space and place that God ordained for you. But check it out, because you have spiritual amnesia, you're in the promised land, but you're still enslaved. You're in something that God brought you to, something that God has given you, but you're being controlled by something you're supposed to control and you're being ruled by something because you forget, you forget the one who gave it to you in the first place. Judges is a description of the spiritual journey, is a description of the human experience where we are in the promised land, but we are not receiving the promises of God. We have a new phase, a new season in our experience, but because we're trying to do it in our own strength, we're trying to operate a new life based off of our old life. We're in the promised land of Canaan, but we're still operating as if we're in Egypt. 
It's as the song says, the devil has us going in cycles where Jonathan McReynolds, he says, didn't I conquer this last year? Tell me what I missed because I fear that it's coming back up again. It must be something I ate. It's the same song. It's the same show. It's the same hate. The devil wants to extend the game. When he wants it to end, he wants a sequel because if he has another chance, he feels as if he can take my joy, my peace, my faith. The devil, he learns from your mistakes. Even if you don't, that's how he keeps you in cycles. When we have spiritual amnesia and we forget the one who blessed us in the first place, the one who helped us in the first place, we keep going in cycles. And when we get stuck on that rat race of human effort, we're saying that this is not what I expected. I want to jump off. I want a redo, I want a do-over, I want a reset, because this is not what I expected. Uh, when I was a kid, I would play video games. Video games didn't belong to me, they belonged to my older brother. And we would play um, Madden, that's football, and we would play um, NBA Live. So we would play football and basketball, and he was older than me and he had more experience than me. Um, but I started out with a plan and a process. I would play with my favorite team. I would run plays. I would run the motion offense and the pick and roll. And I would be in the game at the end of the first quarter. Um, Halftime, I would still be in the game. He would always play with the Chicago Bulls um, because they had Michael Jordan. And at Halftime, I would only be down by like 10 points, but the second half would begin and he would keep passing the ball to Michael Jordan. And by the end of the third quarter, I would be down by like 20 or 30 points. And because we were playing for money or playing for push-ups, I would get, I would get scared. And I would pause the game, acting as if I was going to call a timeout. But because there is no 30-point play in basketball, I would cause a distraction, and I would drop something on the floor, and he would avert his gaze, and I would cancel the game and start over. And if I was down by too much, I would just unplug the game in frustration. I wanted a do-over. I wanted a reset. I was tired of being beat by the same team every day, every month, every year by the same person. I would get behind so much. I didn't have the energy. I would just quit and give up. I wanted to start over, but I still had to pay the price for quitting. I would still have to do the push-ups, y'all. I had a desire in my mind, a framework, a goal, a desire. I was implementing that thing. But because my brother was so much better than me, he would be beating me by a mile. And in my frustration, I would just cut the game off. I wasn't getting what I expected. <laughs> it's not what I planned for the game. And I would just quit and give up. I don't know about you, but that's been the commentary for the last 12 months for me. I thought it was going to be different, but the same things that have been in my life this year are the same things that were in my life last year. The present chapter of my life has some of the same things as the previous chapter of my life. I had these plans and resolutions and intentions and all of the mumbo jumbo but I'm still seeing people die from COVID every day. I still look at my bank account and it's not as high as I want it to be. My credit score is still the same. People are still wearing masks. I still have to wash my hands. I still have to be six feet away from people. Some people haven't seen their loved ones in over a year and they're tired because they're not getting what they expected. And we just want to reset. We want to do over. We're doing the right thing. We're in the right place. And we're not experiencing all that God wants us to experience. 
I need 10 people to type in the chat. I want something different for my life. I want something different for my life. We can be doing the right thing in the right way, in the right space, and still not get what God has for us. It's normal to go through cycles. Israel is in the hands of the enemies for 40 years. Check it out, y'all. They wake up in the promised land but they're under the leadership of their enemies. And they just say, this is not what I expected. And they forget the one who blessed them. They forget the one who did all of this. In Judges chapter one, Joshua dies. And, and when you read the, the, the opening chapter of the book of Judges, the people ask God in verse one, Chapter one, who shall go up to fight the Canaanites? And, and God answers, the men of Judah shall go out and fight the Canaanites. And he says, I will give them into your hands. Everything I told Moses, everything I told Joshua, everything I just told you, I'm going to fulfill it in your life. The men of Judah and the other warriors begin to go from city to city. And we know that there is archaeological evidence of how they invaded the rest of the countryside. But when, when you get to the middle of Judges chapter 1, you begin to see that they experience victory, but their task is always incomplete. And then you get to Judges 2 verse 10, and it says an entire generation passes who don't know the Lord, and they don't remember what God did for his people. When it is that you experience disappointment, it happens because of two things. When we forget our history with God and when we forget our intimacy with God, we experience disappointment and defeat. When we forget our history with God and when we forget our intimacy with God. And because the people of God began to experience not just disappointment, but they began to experience slavery and hardship. God has to raise up judges. He has to raise up temporary leaders to deliver his people, but he has to do it every generation. That's why the book of Judges is a model for the human condition, because at the end of Joshua, Joshua tells them everything that God has done. And he says, if you will serve the Lord, he will bless you. If you cling to him and love him and depend wholly on him, he will be with you. And the people say, we will serve the Lord. But Joshua says, you can't serve the Lord in your human strength. But the people says, these stones are a witness. And they begin in the promised land with victory. And they begin to experience defeat because they forget God and they forget that they're human. Judges is a description of a codependent relationship that people have with God, that Israel has with God, where she commits, she's fine for a while, then she relapses and goes on a Tyler Perry bender, and God has to dry them out and allow their enemies to enslave them. In Judges chapter 2, verses 15 to 19, the Bible says Israel goes out to fight. The Lord's hand is against them. They experience defeat and distress. Then God raises up judges who saves them out of the hands, but they don't listen to the judges. They go back to the gods and worship them. They turn away from their ancestors. Then the Lord raises up another judge, but when the judge saves them, as long as the judges live, God's hand of favor is on them. Verse 19 says, as soon as the judge dies, the people go back and become even more corrupt than their ancestors. They refuse to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways, and they keep going in cycles. What you need to understand is that God's hopes for you, God's dreams for you, God's plans for you, God's expectations for you is not based on you, but it's based on his investment in you. When you're going through cycles of the spiritual life, 
when you're going through cycles of the human life, you're experiencing disappointment and defeat. Remember, I need you to remember the lesson of judges. Don't forget the one who brought you. Don't get spiritual amnesia. Don't forget the one who delivered you. Don't forget the one who saved you. Don't forget the one who preserved you. Don't forget the one who holds you and sustains you and keeps you. Because when you forget the nature of God and the nature of yourself, you will keep going in cycles. And what will happen is you'll get stuck in a cycle of guilt and shame, and you will stay in the places that God never ordained. And you will try to help yourself in human strength, but God never intended for you to help yourself. I remember I was a, a, a youth pastor and uh, we were doing vacation Bible school with some kids from the neighborhood. And these kids from the neighborhood, y'all, they were just like me. They were stubborn and strong-willed. Let's just say they were strong-willed and resilient. Um, we, we, we had an exercise. We had an exercise where I filled up like a five-gallon bucket full of water. And the kids had to take new sponges and they had to put the sponges in the bucket and empty their bucket of water onto the sidewalk. But the task wasn't to take the water out of the bucket with the sponges. The task was to predict how long it would take seven and eight and nine year olds to empty the bucket with their sponges. Y'all, they, they thought it would take X amount of minutes, and we were standing there laughing, knowing that they could never do it. Um, the, 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 the object of the story was not for them to empty the bucket with the sponges. The object of the story was for them to realize that they couldn't do it at all. And when we were, they, the kids got the lesson because their small hands and the small sponges could never absorb five gallons of water in, in 10 minutes. It would take hours for them to empty that bucket. And I remember there was this young Adventist kid. We're going on to the next lesson, but he's there on his knees crying, saying, just give me more time. I can do it. I want to do it. I'm able to do it. Just give me more time. Give me more sponges. Help me out. And I tried to tell him, <laughs> you're fighting a battle. <laughs> you're not built to face. The moral of the story is not how long or how much strength you need to empty the bucket. The moral of the story is for you to realize that you can't do it yourself. Stop fighting battles God never intended you to fight. Stop trying to take possession of things that God never intended for you to do in your own strength. Your job is to get out the way and let God fight your battles. And God will let you go through cycles. God will let you face disappointment. God will let you experience heartache until you realize that it's not about you and it's not on you. And when you're facing disappointment, I need you to remember two things. Remember your history with God and remember your intimacy with God. God told his people in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and chapter 8 that you're going to go into the promised land. He tells them in chapter 8 of Deuteronomy that you're going to forget me when you get the land flowing with milk and honey. And that's why he says, remember the Lord who gives you the power to get wealth. Because he says, when you begin to experience abundance, when you begin to get some of the new things, you're going to get brand new. But remember, I'm not blessing you because you're good. I'm not blessing you because you're special. I actually predict that you're going to be stiff-necked and self-righteous. Remember the lesson of the manna. God tells his people, remember the lesson of the manna. If you remember the lesson of the manna, you will never get brand new and you won't have spiritual amnesia. Or should I say you'll have less spiritual amnesia. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they had no food. God 
he rained water from he brought water from a rock um but they 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 began to he he began to rain down manna from heaven every week every day for six days and on the day of preparation he would give them twice as much i said he would give them twice as much for the sabbath and he says don't hoard my blessings it's coming every day when you try to hoard my blessing it is a sign that you don't trust me when you hoard my blessing it is a sign that you don't trust me to provide for your daily needs but you're going to be human and you're going to be like the squirrel and you're going to bury acorns because you don't trust me to give you the acorns tomorrow i don't know about you but i'm just like the squirrel i don't know what god has done in your life but when God does miracles for me, I still fail to believe in him. I still have spiritual amnesia when it comes to God. I'll be honest and just talk about myself. When my mother died, I was two years old and I thought I would never have a family. God gave me several families in foster care and I thought that nobody would adopt me. And when I was adopted, I thought I would never be a success. When I got college scholarships, I never believed that I could do the work. When I failed out of school twice, God got me to Oakwood. He gave me the money. He gave me the books. He gave me a place to stay. And as soon as I faced my first difficulty, I got spiritual amnesia. And my mentor said, Joe, dance with the one who brought you in the first place. The song says, if he did it before, he'll do it again. It's the same God right now because it's the same God back then. I need you to type in the chat that God hasn't changed. Remember your history with God. Remember the things that God has done in your life. Remember your history with God. But when you're facing disappointment, when you're going through cycles, I need you to not, not only remember your history with God, I need you to remember, I need you to remember your intimacy with God. Or should I say God's intimacy with you? <laughs> you see that God knows everything about you. Um, God knew everything about you before there was a you. Um, God tells the children of Israel, he tells Abraham, he tells Moses, he tells Joshua, you are going into a land, you're going to be rebellious, you're going to be stiff necked, you're going to abandon me, you're going to prostitute yourself, you're going to fail, you're going to fall flat on your face. That, that means God knew you were going to be rebellious. He knew you were going to be stiff-necked. He knew you were going to go through cycles. He knew you was going to put one step forward and take two steps backwards. He knew you were going to have some red days, and he knew you were going to have some green days. Thank God that my failure does not catch God by surprise. God knows everything about you and his thoughts towards you, his intentions towards you does not change. We told you that we're getting ready to have a baby in a few weeks, um, in, in a few weeks, in about three weeks and, and four days, um, baby Michael is coming. In anticipation of having this baby, there were some things we had to do to prepare. We have more doctor's appointments than I can keep track of. That's why we keep track of them on a calendar. We go to the doctor, we go to the gynecologist, we go to this doctor and that doctor and all of these tests to get checkups in anticipation for the baby. In anticipation for the baby, we put together a nursery and a crib and I put together a dresser, y'all. It was about 5 million pieces. It took me 10 hours, but I did it in anticipation of the baby that's coming. We bought clothes and people bought clothes for us. We, the, the baby got more clothes and more shoes than I ever had in my entire life. We did a maternity shoot in preparation of announcement for this baby. But one thing we did in preparation for the baby, we had more showers than I can keep track of. People bought us gifts. People bought us clothes. People bought us books. People gave us um, um, advice. 
of the first year and the first month and the first week. And we're reading books and attending classes all in preparation for this baby. But one thing we did is we have about 6,000 diapers. We have enough diapers for the first year in anticipation for this baby. We know that every baby is cute. We know that every baby is cuddly. We know that every baby is the promise and hope of its parents. But we know that there's going to be some sleepless nights. We know that there's going to be some blowouts. We know that there's going to be some soiled diapers. I know that he's going to pee in my face. I know that he's going to make a mess after we've cleaned him up and cleaned up the house. But in anticipation of the good times, we're also anticipating the dirty and soily times. And the first time the baby, the first time he craps his diapers, we're not going to return the baby to the hospital because we're not getting what we didn't expect. We anticipate what the baby's going to do. We predict that there's going to be some good days and bad days. We predict that there's going to be some joyous times and some painful times. But every time we experience something with the baby, we're going to remember our history and we're going to remember our intimacy. We're going to remember that life is about cycles, that we're going to take two steps forward and three steps backwards, but we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. God predicted to Abraham that his descendants would come to the promised land and be stiff-necked. God predicted to Moses that his people would be free, but still have the bondage of Egypt in their minds. God predicted that his people would forget him, that his people would abandon him, that his people would go through cycles. But none of it stops God from being God. And none of it stops the people from being his child. So I need you to understand that your bad choices did not catch God by surprise. Your disobedience, your defeat is actually anticipated. So when you read Judges chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6, and you see all of the judges that God sends to deliver the children of Israel, it is a reminder that we all go through cycles. The spiritual journey goes through cycles because every human leader, every human deliverer will ultimately fail because you don't need another mentor. You don't need another leader. You don't need another politician. When you're going through cycles of the human condition, what you need is a savior. That's why Romans 5 tells us at the right time when we were powerless, when we were going through cycles, when we were hopeless, when we were defeated, Christ died for the ungodly. He says God demonstrates his love toward us that while we were sinners, when we had amnesia, when we were defeated, when we were enslaved, when we abandoned him, he died for us. So you're going to experience defeat. You're going to get in life in the spiritual journey what you don't expect. But remember your history with God and remember God's history with you. Remember your intimacy with God and remember God's intimacy with you. There is nothing you can do that will stop God from being your God and that will stop you from being his child. Bow your heads with me, Father in heaven. We know that we go through cycles. We know we know all of the things you promised us. We know that we're going to get spiritual amnesia. We know that we're going to forget. But you ask us when we're at the bottom to remember our history with you and to remember our intimacy with you. And when we get in life what we don't expect, we ask you to give us the fortitude. Let's just keep it 100 we need you to take our hand because we're not going to give it to you. When we've been enslaved by the same things, the same snares, the same habits, the same sins, we need you to not just send an avenger. Don't just send a hero. God, send us your son. 
We ask you to do that even now in Jesus' name. And all God's people types in the chat. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. 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 I want to thank you, Elder Williams, for bringing 